Last week we began our orientation on Hermetic philosophy, and as the subject indicates, we must continue this orientation this evening. While it may seem that our development will be essentially historical, this is not the full intent of our present approach. Actually, history in this case is rich with overtones and implications of dynamic philosophical importance. We are not interested merely in digging into the past for the sake of unearthing the intellectual artifacts of our ancestors. We are, however, mindful of the living content of things, which is timeless and has continuing vitality for us. I had a letter through the mail today, a very highly confused person. This person would not have been confused had they possessed any adequate integration around the essential substance of the beliefs with which they were concerned. The living person today, in the search for his own believing, finds it very important to defend values and to protect himself against the superficial attitudes and false interpretations which are so common in relation to great systems of religion and philosophy. We have to have a certain amount of factual background. Lacking in this, we are unable to orient and integrate or to keep our minds clear in our present thinking. So if we sharpen our thinking a little, it will do us no harm in our daily living where we have been inclined <coughs> to save the mental instrument, protect it from labor, and come too quickly into easy believing, in which there is never any really adequate reward. We have taken this evening three parallel systems for consideration. The Hermetic philosophy, the Gnostic philosophy, and the Neoplatonic philosophy. Now, it's more than a coincidence that these should all have flourished in Alexandria in the opening years of the Christian era. It is also not a coincidence that all of these were closely involved in the rise of Christianity. Nor is it by any means accidental that in a strange way, as St. Augustine points out, these three sects were in large measure responsible for Christianity. Now, this does not mean he did not certainly intend to imply that Christianity had merely copied these doctrines. Rather, that Christianity, confronted by three schools of the magnitude of these, was forced to make very definite plans of its own. It was forced to overcome at an early date as many of the divisions within its own structure as possible. It required a united front against a world that was not ignorant, not stupid, and not gullible. It therefore was a challenge, and it was this tremendous challenge that to a large measure resulted in the final Council of Nicaea and the Christianizing of the Western Roman Empire. It had not, had it not been for these sects, it is very likely that Christianity might have dissolved in its own internal discords. But confronted by these large enemies, it gathered its resources, defined its position ever more clearly, and finally came to a condition of ascendancy. Thus they formed the adversary, which sharpened the wits of the early Christian fathers and caused them to give much more scholarly attention to their own doctrines than might have been their original inclination. So we have these three schools, and the order of them we should also consider. Uh, for antiquity, the Hermetic philosophy was probably slightly the elder. In other words, it probably arose slightly earlier than Christianity, 100, 200 years, possibly 300. 
It also extended downward through the Christian era and down to the 4th or 5th centuries A.D. The second uh, in historical descent was Gnosticism, uh, which belongs to the first Christian century primarily. It arose probably not later than A.D. 30 and continued to exercise a considerable influence down to also to the 5th century A.D. The third of this group was Neoplatonism, which probably arose in the latter part of the 2nd and probably somewhat in the early part of the 3rd century A.D. and continued to exercise considerable influence until the 5th century. Thus these three organizations uh, coexisted with the early Christian development. And by the nature of their teachings, this coexistence was again more than coincidental. For when we study these three systems, we observe marked parallels among themselves and to Christianity. The question as to who borrowed from who has always been a moot one, and we will not even attempt to explain and interpret it. We can only say that these persons lived together, that they lived in speaking distance of each other, and that they were united by a common tongue. We know, for example, that St. Augustine was highly conversant with Neoplatonism, and apparently did not hold it in essential disregard, although he publicly criticized it on some occasions. Actually, a large part of his own philosophy was certainly influenced by Neoplatonic thought. Trying to analyze the structure of these three uh, uh, non-Christian groups to determine their essential keynote, what was the essential difference between them? The more you read about them, the less difference you observe, until a number of writers have practically given up in despair any effort to distinguish their essential doctrines. These doctrines are so close uh, that they are regarded almost as identical. Actually, they are not identical, because each presents a particular perspective about something uh, in which they all have a common interest. The principal foundation of the Hermetic arts must be regarded as scientific. Hermetism, or Hermetic philosophy, was a science. And as it developed, it developed strongly along scientific lines until in the Middle Ages, Hermetic philosophy became the synonym of chemistry. It was based upon a series of exact procedures. It was mathematical, and it made very little use of factors uh, beyond the comprehension of the average person, although it did have certain abstract teachings. These abstract teachings, like Buddhism and Confucianism, were rooted in natural phenomena. They were rooted in familiar things, in common everyday occurrences. In this, the Hermetic school borrowed considerably from the Egyptian. For while the Egyptian had a very deep mysticism, his mysticism was always clothed in the familiar forms of natural phenomena. His uh, after-world state, or after-death state, for example, the Elysian Fields. Uh, well, this paradise was very similar to the Delta of the Nile. In fact, there was very little difference. Here, the celestial blessed did not rest forever, but had their proper cattle and plowed their fields just as they did on earth. The only thing is that the difference between the terrestrial Nile and the celestial Nile was essentially that the celestial Nile never failed whereas the terrestrial Nile sometimes did not rise appropriately and there could be famines in the land. But the heavenly streams, uh, sustained and protected by the gods, meant forever that there would be prosperity in the, in the blessed world and that everyone would have enough to eat, everyone would enjoy the advantages of good living. Now there's no doubt that the Egyptian priests and philosophers went beyond this point but it is also an evident part of the daily religion of the people. And Hermetic philosophy has a relation to this. It also went far beyond materialism, but it never went beyond the concept of a universal law. It never transcended the idea that divine procedures were mathematical, that cause and effect were 
inevitable that uh, the progress of the human being came through the mastery of certain sciences and of course the science of sciences was that of life itself therefore hermetic philosophy emphasized life as an exact science a science of human generation and regeneration a science of human perfection and the hermetists believed and affirmed that the keys to this science like the advanced formulas of mathematics were reserved to certain persons who advanced themselves uh, in these subjects and have become entitled to receive the great instruction thus everything moved forward on a very orderly procedure the hermetic school was a kind of university in which the students advanced from grade to grade according to their abilities this was a strong point in favor of the school but also the secret of its ultimate dissolution the average human being having reached mature years does not want to go to school he does not want a way of life that is dominated by a procedure of constant learning he feels when he has reached a certain degree of intelligence that he should go out and enjoy himself therefore the hermetic science was essentially restricted to those of scientific instinct not necessarily of scientific attainment but individuals who like to approach life as an exact problem a mystery to be solved by the instruments of science and we must not overlook the fact that the instruments of science available in those days were better than we believe or generally accept we were not uh, living in as dark a time as the modern historian would depict the um, hermetic philosopher had many instruments he had already received the great arts and sciences of Greece and Egypt he was already a master of liberal arts he already had many instruments by means of which he could attain his end but there was something much in uh, to recall to us the great architects of the ancient world in the hermetic school these architects fashioned magnificent structures and hermetic philosophy was a concept of a magnificent structure built according to laws built like a vast college or school a school of life from which no one could graduate without attaining perfection a school that challenged the person from the cradle to the grave a school in which he must continue to learn till the day he died obviously this type of thinking would not appeal strongly to the shopkeeper the merchant the average person whose interest in science was largely utilitarian whose knowledge of architecture was exhausted in familiarizing himself with the house in which he lived this type of thinking therefore did not have glamour it did not have the magnetic appeal of mystery finally because the hermetic school was constantly declaring that there was no mystery in mysticism that mystery was an illusion that actually what we call mysterious is nothing but that part of the universe about which we are ignorant that there can be no real mysteries and the person growing up is not a magician not a wonder worker he is a scientist gradually familiarizing himself with laws and keeping them and gradually developing a great ethical spiritual code based upon these laws therefore actually in a sense uh, an exact way of life built upon observation experimentation reflection and tradition as inheriting the sciences of ancient Egypt the hermetic philosophers therefore thought in terms of medicine they thought in terms of legislation of jurisprudence and common law they thought in terms of mathematics astronomy and music uh, they were distinctly working with subjects which had to be skillfully mastered and the real proficient was the person who developed the skills to do these things superbly and education was to give him the skill not only to practice the daily sciences known at the time
but also the skill to reorganize, redeem, and perfect his own life. Everything was therefore uh, a rather a highly educational program, intensely directed toward the person who, having gained what education he could in the world in which he lived, desired to go on and learn more, learn more about how to perform specific tasks, learn how to build a better ship, learn how to rediscover and use the lost secrets of Tyrian dyes, learn how to perfect chemicals and drugs, learn how to uh, perform a delicate surgery on the human body, to learn chemistry and physiology and anatomy. All these things came as part of the Hermetic doctrine, overtoned, however, by the great concept that all knowledge was sacred. Therefore, that the physician and the judge and the lawyer were actually priests of a universal mystery. And the Hermetic philosophy points out that the end of all of this knowledge is to discover the wisdom and the exactitude and the goodness of divine providence. Thus it uh, is quite conceivable that the Hermetic physician could be of interest and value today to a great many persons. Perhaps our modern scientists are deficient principally in the Hermetic overtone, this overtone that science is divine, that the scientist is not one who must build a religion, but rather a man who must experience the imminence of all divine matters in the very exactitudes with which he daily works. Now this in substance, I think, is the perspective of Hermetic philosophy as distinguished now from these other groups that we wish to discuss. Now what is the perspective of Gnosticism? Not long ago on Sunday morning we gave a discussion of the Gnostic ideals of Valentinus. Uh, therefore, we will assume that many of you heard that. We will digest it a little, but try to cover the ground for those who did not hear this lecture. Gnosticism, which arose in both Syria and North Africa, in the uh, first century, within the first 30 or 40 years of the Christian era, had one peculiar disadvantage from the beginning. It was never a completely united system. Gnosticism was always at least a three-pronged instrument. Gnosticism was broken up at a very early period into sects. In fact, what we know as Gnosticism together, altogether is practically a union of sects initially divided. Thus, instead of having a system strong, around a central core, or a central teacher, or a central leader, we have a dozen or more groups with various backgrounds and various religious doctrines with which they were attempting to create the Gnostic position. We know the word Gnostic from Gnosis to know. <coughs> it was a search for knowledge, but essentially the Gnostic was a religionist. Instead of being a scientist, he was a theologian. He was attempting the same principle that dominated uh, the Hermetic philosopher, but he was working upon an entirely different concept, namely that through the extensive interpretation of, clarification of, the theological and religious structure of the time, he would find the true, actual, eternal and universal faith, that he would come into possession of the true religion, the one religion. <clears throat> Early in his experience, therefore, by the very diversity of his background, the Gnostic began to be a student of comparative religion. He began to think not of one faith alone, but of many faiths. And in the schools of Gnosticism, there were followers of many beliefs and many religious systems. The only answer to this, therefore, was the recognition of the unities underlying spiritual revelation. No, the Gnostic believed in revelation. 
He believed that the final source of knowledge was the power or grace of God bestowed upon him so that he might know as an inner or spiritual certainty those things which could not be comprehended by the intellect. Therefore, he practiced visions. He practiced certain forms of magical rites and ceremonies. He invoked deities, and he sought to gain the intercession of divine powers and the advancement of his material uh, state or the continuance of his spiritual growth. The three great schools of Gnosticism that have descended to us, the Syrian under Simon Magus, the Egyptian under Basilides, and the other Egyptian school under Valentinus, constitute only three of probably nearly a dozen branches. These represented again, however, a very peculiar level of thinking. If the ancient was not inclined to be scientific in a large way, he was not also inclined to be theological in a large way as the Gnostic understood the term. For example, the average Roman, the average Alexandrian, the average Egyptian or, or person of the area certainly could not discourse learnedly on comparative religion. Western man could hardly do it until the last few centuries. It was not common for the believer in those days to have any interest in beliefs other than his own. As we mentioned last week, the state religions, uh, the various gods ruling areas and provinces, uh, formed the background of the theologies of local groups. They seldom went beyond these. And it had, had it not been for Rome, probably the whole concept of comparative religion would have been greatly delayed. But the Roman Empire, by conquest and colonization, forced this study upon the dawning mind of European man. Gnosticism, we will say then, was represented by little groups, probably a hundred little groups, divided into eight or ten schools. These little groups consisted of a teacher, something like an oriental yogin or master of the Vedanta system, a saintly person. This saintly person was surrounded by disciples. These disciples in smaller areas might be a dozen, in larger areas perhaps a hundred. But it is very doubtful if during the rise of Gnosticism that the total body of the Gnostic order ever reached more than two or three thousand. It could not, for the simple reason that it demanded a kind of thinking that was strange to the time. It demanded the individual devote a great deal of personal labor to the contemplation and interpretation of things. It made it necessary for the believer to examine the various aspects of the deity he worshipped, as these aspects were found in the uh, religions and beliefs of maybe a dozen other nations. This kind of contemplation was not for the marketplace. It was not for the individual who was busy in the merchandising of his daily profession or trade. Thus the uh, Gnostics almost immediately became ascetics, wandered into the wilderness, separated themselves largely from the communion of other persons of other interests. They were content to be devout, content to contemplate and to meditate, uh, to pray and to examine the secrets of religion as they understood these secrets. Naturally, under this uh, pattern, they did not have the staying power because they could not touch the popular mind. They could not touch the majority of people. It's probable that even in their own day, the Gnostics were regarded as mysterious, as being persons set apart, strange, perhaps even mad. Their thinking was not in the terms of prevailing orthodoxy. The Syrian Gnostics had trouble with the orthodox Jewish religion. Later, the Christian Gnostics had trouble with Christianity. 
the uh, one link between the Gnostics and Christianity uh, that remained strong for a considerable period of time was the link of the teachings of St. Paul. Uh, the Paulian group were very was very close to the Gnosis, and many of the Gnostic teachers quoted St. Paul as being the outstanding example of the uh, teacher of their time relating to the mystery of Christianity. Now the Gnosis moved toward Christianity, and Christianity certainly enveloped phases of the Gnosis. But there was always a conflict there that could not be completely reconciled. The nearest point of reconciliation being in the works of Paul. In Gnosticism, for example, the principle of redemption was an eternal principle, ever functioning. The principle of redemption in Gnosticism was unhistorical. It was known to the first man and it would be known to the last man because redemption was an attribute of eternal deity itself. Redemption, therefore, did not center upon any historical time or historical person. Gradually, in the Christian Gnosis, an effort was made uh, to apply this redemptive principle exclusively uh, to the person of Jesus. The Gnostics made a valiant attempt at this, but when you look in perspective over 18 or 1900 years, uh, the patchwork, uh, the, the tragic difficulties which their philosophy or religion passed through in this effort uh, to combine itself with another doctrine, these difficulties become increasingly apparent. Uh, the historical redemption concept was not Gnostic, and the Gnostics who attempted to follow it did so with a good spirit and a good heart, but never consistent with their own original teaching. Thus Gnosticism uh, was a religion seeking a universal experience of God. It was a little bit in the feeling of the teachings of Akhenaten. It was this sudden bursting forth of the realization that there was only one God. And that this one God was the God of the friend and the enemy, the God of races and nations, and had an existence beyond all attributes, all terms, and all names that could be bestowed upon this divine principle. Immediately, the Gnostic deity begins to emerge. And we are in the presence of a universal, eternal, unchangeable principle of mystery. Mystery, however, which is penetrated primarily through religion. Uh, a mystery which is approached by utter humility and complete devotion, seeking always that mysterious hour which no man knoweth, the hour when the grace of God shall richly descend upon the individual. Now, Gnosticism, having created a perfect God, or having conceived one, found itself upon the horns of a dilemma, because from this perfect God it must explain an imperfect universe. It must proceed to develop the idea of how this God could produce less than itself, how this deity, forever wise, forever good, forever beautiful, uh, could be responsible for the confusion which existed even in Alexandria in the first century. Because, after all, man's confusion, like his living, has been eternal. In order to explain this mystery, Gnosticism assumed or expounded what is called emanationism. This emanationism is of Platonic origin, but its uh, relation to Plato gradually uh, vanished uh, as a factor in thinking. And this emanationism is to the effect that as this resplendent and magnificent divine power, perfect and effulgent in all its parts, is the radiant core, source, and heart of things, its radiance extending outward forms a kind of halo or nimbus. And this first brilliant uh, nimbus surrounding the mysterious, unknowable core of things, the Gnostics called nous, or mind. 
They declared, therefore, that mind was the revelation of that which was beyond the mind and above mind, and that the creative works of the world were accomplished by a mind suspended from a consciousness, that this mind was subservient to that consciousness, and that this mind ultimately returned to that consciousness, either in the form of the individual mind or in the, co the collective universal mind. Then this effulgency, continuing to radiate outward, like the streamers of the corona of the sun, gradually radiated further and further into darkness. And as it radiated, it became weaker and more diffused, until these emanations of light uh, became less and less powerful and were ultimately absorbed, dissolved, or eaten up by the darkness of space. Therefore, imperfection constitutes that part of existence or creation in which the rays of the central consciousness are not strong enough to control or to blaze through and reveal themselves. And the absolute circumference of existence is matter. And matter is that part of life in which the light has been absorbed until it is no longer obvious or apparent. The Gnostics, being essentially dualists, then affirmed uh, that what we call matter is essentially the principle of evil. That evil is this darkness. Evil is the victory of space over spirit. Victory is the, uh, this victory is the inertia, which is at the extreme circumference of action. It is not a central inertia, but a circumference inertia in which, as Plato points out, if you stand close to the light of the candle, you can read the book. But if you are 20 feet from the light of the candle, you can no longer read the book, because the light is not strong enough. In the same way, if we stand close to the noose, or the source of light, we can read the book of life. But if we are far removed from it, the light is not strong enough, and we cannot read. And the minds and bodies of men, having dissolved and absorbed this light into themselves, it is no longer available for immediate purpose of illumination. In this dark circumference, then, the spirits of negation had their abode. And in Gnosticism, it is only fair to point out that they did not actually believe in a principle of evil. They believed, however, in the existence of beings in whom darkness dominated, therefore in whom light was not sufficient, and what we call the bad person or the demonic person, is the one whose light is so obscured that he can no longer live by it. Thus, uh, the Gnostics had a, a, a very handy and convenient framework upon which to develop a very complicated system of analogies. They were able to prove that the impoverishment of light is the cause of darkness. They were able to demonstrate to their own satisfaction Therefore, that materialism is simply the impoverishment of light. That where everything is not light, it is because it has absorbed light, and the light is not strong enough to break through it. Under the Gnostic system, therefore, the great purpose of life was to release the light. Was that the individual, through a decision or determination of his own mind, must choose to free the light in himself. He must dedicate himself to such work, such labors, and such, such processes as would so purify and redeem his nature that the light could be released. Thus, all growth was a release of the divine life from within things. This, ta this concept was also derived from Plato, uh, but the Gnostics developed in, in, into their very complicated eonology in which they conceived of man gradually, by various disciplines, refining himself, choosing to separate himself from darkness, uh, choosing to overcome the ignorance, which was the opacity of himself, so that the light within him could shine through, and that he could release the imprisoned light, so that this light could return to the source of light, the divine aeons from which it came. In order to achieve this, according to the Gnostics, the presence of Nous or the divine mind 
the firstborn of the eternal, gave the discrimination, gave the insight, uh, gave the aspiration and the rationalization necessary to liberate man by an action of his own will. By means of mind, man is therefore forever at the gate of liberation. The Gnostic, however, was not uh, optimistic enough to overlook the fact that mind could also be a destroying power. He therefore recognized a divine mind in the likeness of the eternal Father, and a mortal mind in the likeness of, likeness of the darkness, and that the mind of man accepting darkness was deluded by his own acceptance, but the mind of man yearning toward the light was liberated by his own yearning. Beneath this process the mind was an instrument but the primary end was a spiritual release, the restoration of a true spiritual state, and mind was therefore sacrificed to the liberation of pure consciousness uh, by a voluntary purpose. And the achievement of this purification actually represented a series of Gnostic baptisms the individual was required to practice the highest form of religious conviction from the earliest time of his association with the order until through renunciation, regeneration, prayer, meditation, contemplation, and through the total sacrifice of all worldliness, his truly spiritual nature might be released from the cravings of his lower nature and the light within him could shine through a purified body. Purification in Gnosticism was to be attained by the practice of the spiritual way of life, the individual becoming no longer dominant, dominated by or bound to matter, verged away from it, and toward the light from which he came. It is a, quite an elaborate system, but uh, I think the essential principle of it lies in this dualism and the fact that consciousness imprisoned in every living thing is the redeemer of that thing and that this redemption must result from man making a voluntary dedication of his total existence to the service of this consciousness within him if he did so then he was truly uh, upon the way of gnosis and this way was a series of mystical expansions dominated almost totally by theological concepts, principles, and doctrines. Now the third of our systems, which we want to contemplate for the moment, is Neoplatonism. And Neoplatonism in this triad certainly plays the part of philosophy. Neoplatonism was Platonic philosophy plus the experience of man for 500 years or 600 years after the death of Plato. As we have noted in the previous discussion, the world of the first and second centuries A.D. was a very confused world, a world of disillusionments and despairs, a world in which rationality in the form of a great system of thought was not sufficient in itself to meet the needs of a large group of persons, those by nature philosophical, those who like to contemplate the great ethical structures of life stood in desperate need of a restoration of ethics. And this restoration of ethics, as is usually the case in a corrupt or decadent era, included a more or less violent revulsion against the abuses which then dominated uh, the practices of society and also of education, culture, and the sciences. The Neoplatonists were working with the principle of wisdom. They were elevating not the mind, but something beyond and superior to the mind to first place in the contemplation of reality. Whereas in Gnosticism, universal <coughs> deity was the absolute good, in Neoplatonism, the absolute or universal deity was absolute truth. And in this, 
we have an entirely different premise, although the words in practical experience often seem to become synonymous. They are synonymous upon levels. Uh, the philosopher was working to achieve the experience of that truth which solves all error or refutes all error. He assumed, therefore, the existence in space of a quality known as truth. He was perfectly willing to assume that this truth was an attribute of deity. But in some way, the Neoplatonic concept of deity was this all-truthfulness. And he would say that if a thing is all-truthful, it is also all-good. Therefore, a thing that is truthful is good, whereas the Gnostic might have reversed it in the religious position and said, a thing that is good must be truthful. It was a different approach with the postulation of a different end. The uh, mystic of the Gnostic school, seeking this end, which is the all-embracing uh, love of God, Whereas the Neoplatonists sought that end as the all-embracing understanding by means of which he himself might experience the state of total truth. Now he sought truth not from the selfish intellectual desire, as Plotinus very clearly points out. He did not wish to be assumed to know more than other men. He was not of the type who wanted to get up and say, this is the truth. His truth was beyond articulation, in word or even in thought. His truth approached a mystical experience in itself. But whereas one had the infinite believing of the Gnostic, the other had the strange desire to believe through knowing that the individual could never be sure till he knows. Therefore, the development of the power to know until this knowledge revealed all things normal and all things necessary represented largely the Neoplatonic position. Neoplatonism arose then as an effort to link the philosophy of Plato with the need for a spiritual, emotional experience of truth. Uh, this uh, experience of truth could not be merely the transference of information. No individual could say to another man, confidentially, this is the truth. Even if it was so, and even if the statement was true, there could be no communication of truth apart from, an, from a dynamic experience which involved the immediate sense of internal knowing on the part of the person to whom the so-called truth was communicated. Truth could never be anything worldly. It could never be the truth about planets or comets or the tides or the seasons. This truth had to be the all truth, which was man's experience of the true discovery of his relationship to everything that exists, including himself. And in order to have this experience, he must also have the full experience of the wonderful world structure to which he was intimately related. He must not only think of God and about God, he must think with God. So Neoplatonism was this search for truthful thinking, thinking with the mind of God. Thus, as the uh, hermetic philosophers might have assumed God to be absolute law, and the uh, Gnostic school absolute good or absolute virtue, so, in the uh, Neoplatonic school, God was the continuous state of absolute knowing. God knows all things. 
God is a state of eternal knowing without center or circumference. That which knows all things notes also the sparrow's fall. God is a universal knowing beyond mind, a knowing which is seated in the heart-mind structure of every creature so that man is capable of a kind of knowing that is without mind, a kind of knowing that is strangely passionless. And yet when experience is a total experience from which no part of the being can escape and which causes afterwards the individual to say with a strange finality of revelation, I know. Yet this same person could not say what he knows, because his knowledge is not of things, but of the eternal value which lies beneath all things. Thus knowing in Neoplatonism is practically and uh, functionally this internal power to know value, uh, to apperceive or apprehend essential essence in things and to experience identity with essence. Neoplatonism therefore would follow in the Buddhist concept that while man seems to have a mind and seems to have a knowing power, he is actually knowing with the mind of God, whether he knows it or not. And this mind which seems to be his is actually an eternal mind, the eternity of which he has not recognized or accepted. Thus Neoplatonism carries with it a certain pattern of acceptances, acceptances of the presence of value where it might not immediately be suspected. Now what was the structure of Neoplatonism in relation to some of these problems with which we are concerned? It is not difficult to realize that when we start talking about essence and knowing and the power to know apart from the power to think, uh, that the Neoplatonists left the larger part of the Greco-Egyptian world behind them. They were thinking in an entirely different dimension also from their contemporaries. Furthermore, although Neoplatonism had within it a large number of the elements of a religion. It was not essentially religious. It was essentially a descent of the great idealistic philosophy of the classic Hellenes. As a result of this, it lacked many of the elements of glamour. St. Augustine, analyzing it in his own time, held that as far as value content was concerned, Neoplatonism was entitled to become a world religion. It had a tremendous contribution to make, and even Augustine admitted it. But he declared that it could not accomplish this, first of all, because it did not have anything to focus the public mind. It had no appeal. It lacked, as, he, as Augustine pointed out, the first essential of a religion, namely an heroic personality, uh, preferably a martyr that only around this concept have religions successfully been built. The second thing it lacked was a, an offering of a perpetual state of bliss or a perpetual state of illumination to the average man. It did not offer to the average person very much probability that in his lifetime, in the common affairs of his daily thinking, he would be likely to achieve to this state of knowing. It must again be reserved for the person who is willing to dedicate his life, his resources, his time, everything that he has to the prodigious examination of himself and of his universe and the contemplation of internal wealth, the wealth of idea, the pure wealth of contemplative induction. Uh, this type of thinking certainly could not be popular. Also again, not only was Neoplatonism a minority group, uh, but it 
drew around itself only a limited number of scholars, most of them not glamorous, very few of them understood, and all of them inclined to express their ideas on so abstract a level of dissertation or of oration or of uh, writing, <coughs> such as the Aeneid Sopropolis or Plotinus, that they simply were not comprehensible to the average person. <coughs> Thus we had three schools, all of them essentially deep, <coughs> all of them descending from old footings, each one of them strangely and wonderfully practical, but all of them deficient in popular appeal, and all of them deficient in obvious simplicity, too complicated, uh, too recondite, uh, not uh, suitable to move masses. Now at this time, and under these conditions, uh, the relationship between these schools and Christianity can be more clearly understood. Christianity moved into this great focus with an extremely simple moral ethical code. Actually, in spite of the various writings of the early church fathers, who some of them were rather vitriolic on the subject, there is no real indication that Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, or Hermeticism ever actually assailed the teachings of Jesus. They did not. They were quite aware of the ethical integrity, the simple and tremendous vitality of these teachings. Each one of them, perhaps in its own way, could have proven these teachings far better than the church theologians could have proved them. Each one had a deep sympathy for the essence. But each was composed of a type of mind that also belonged in a, in a minority group. First of all, these three groups were made up of persons living out of time in a strange way. So, uh, perhaps the Neoplatonists were born 500 years too late. Perhaps the Hermetic philosophers were born a thousand years too soon. And perhaps the Gnostic had the unfortunate misfortune of being born at a strategic moment when other things were more important than his own ideas. But all of these groups had a strange uh, lack of contemporary vitality. They were deep. Many of them had descended from the old mystery systems. They had within themselves sciences and forms of knowledge that should not and did not die. But not one of them was in a position to step into the great human tragedy that was moving the face of the Near East and the Mediterranean area at the time. They could not console the average person under loss, under pain, <coughs> under misery. They did not have this power of direct approach. They could take the ignorant man and educate him. They could take the unlearned man, and if he wanted to become learned, they could teach him. But they could not take the average person and console him where he was as he was. And because of these situations, the groups fell into a minority relationship to the rising power of Christianity, which had a tremendous appeal to a very large group of persons under misfortune who wished consolation, who wanted something upon which to build hope and faith immediately, something to sustain them in a very heavy crisis. Now what neither the church nor anyone else could know at that time was that the history of Europe and Western civilization from the beginning of the Christian era to the present day has been one constant sequence of crises. There has hardly been a moment in which the immediate need for consolation was not present. Thus the old scholarly motions uh, fell further and further back away from the popular mind. 
And uh, one by one, these older groups or their descendants uh, lost popular interest. And uh, we can say that this situation repeated itself continuously throughout history. There have always been Gnostics and Hermetists and Neoplatonists. There are today. There are always those persons who by endowments of one kind or another are moved into a contemplative relationship with life. There are also others whose nature is such that they are in constant need of the consoling presence of an extremely simple, direct hope. Now, what is the essential reason for this difference? Is it because some people are more sophisticated than others? Is it because some individuals like to be intellectual? Is it that some individuals pose as scientists and that others still perhaps wish to gain distinction as philosophers? I do not think it is this at all or any of these factors. They may exist, but I think they exist only as isolated incidents. The difference lies in the psychic integration of the being himself. They lie, the differences lie in the capacity of the person in terms of his needs, of his possible acceptances, and of his inevitable rejections. Some have gone to Far so far as to say these differences arise from chemical biology alone. This I also doubt. But there is no doubt that there is a psychological chemistry in man, and that this chemistry produces different types of persons due to their own backgrounds, due perhaps, if we believe in rebirth, to earlier existences and previous experiences. But in any event, they are not the same. There will always be, and there always has been, a limited group that will think gnosis, regardless. There is a limited group that will think in terms of hermetism. There is a limited group that will think in terms of Neoplatonism. They simply have these natural instincts. They cannot go against them. For no man can accept that which goes against something within himself. And the differences lie there. And the demarcations and segregations of values lie within the individual. And for that reason, there will always be majority religions and there will be minority faiths. The thing that we can hope is that they do not have to remain forever in antagonistic relationship to each other. That they can be recognized as complementary and not regarded as separating man from man. Actually, in the case of the three we are discussing, uh, they could un undoubtedly have contributed much had they been able to unite around the core of the practical Christian need. They probably could have saved Europe the Dark Ages. But because of the lack of sympathy between groups, and because those who do not understand must always be impatient of that which they do not understand, Lack of understanding ran instantly into misunderstanding, and, which in t and this in turn led inevitably to conflict. The conflict was one-sided from the beginning, because uh, the number of persons involved in the public appeal was so, di and so different that none of these minority groups ever really had a chance. Uh, they could not compete. They could not actually survive as such. But we also have to realize that leaders, regardless of what they lead, must of themselves also have attributes of leadership. And in the background of Christianity, there were a number of persons, Christian by conviction and conversion, and yet by nature and mind, scientists. abstract intellectual powers certainly dip deeply into Neoplatonism and into Gnosticism. And as a result of this, the Church itself gradually passed into a schismatic state in which the heresies began to appear. These heresies resulting very largely from the intellectual individuality of leaders. 
which continued to beset the faith even after these other organizations uh, no longer presented a challenge. Actually, therefore, we must recognize that these three great systems and several others, to lesser degree, have influenced the rise of Christianity. They have influenced its doctrines. And as we have said, the uniting of the Christian front against these non-Christian movements hastened the rise of hierarchical Christianity. That is, the rise of a strong central church government uh, capable of clearly stating its own convictions. And this, in turn, called up the councils, uh, the various... Uh, gatherings, the synods, and the assemblies in which the great uh, uh, ecclesiastical principles were variously debated until gradually the Christianity that we know took form and appeared. Now if we have these uh, patterns a little bit familiar to us, we can see uh, essentially uh, that even in our own thinking, as in those days, the individual is not united. Uh, Synesius of Alexandria was a Christian bishop, a Neoplatonist, a Gnostic, and a Hermetist at the same time, and found no difficulty, no conflict, no contradiction, and no heresy, simply because he had not the kind of intellectual capacity the pigeonholed various concepts within his own nature. He was perhaps more able uh, to build a magnificent faith upon the total reconciliation of the inconsistencies between these doctrines. He was also able, by the grace of God, to retain his orthodox standing in spite of all of these modifying circumstances. He therefore represents, in a sense, the synthesis of these beliefs, and to our thinking today, a rather outstanding example of the possibility of religious reconciliation. Now, reconciliation in our time does involve very strongly the problem of these three schools, and still, to a measure, the prevailing orthodoxy in which these schools function. Today, for example, we have in the world a prevailing orthodoxy. Whether it be a Christian orthodoxy or a Hindu orthodoxy is not important at the moment. We have the majority of the human beings of this world religiously integrated around certain simple, basic beliefs. These beliefs include certainly the reality of the existence of God, the immortality of the human soul, and the victory of good over evil. Uh, these beliefs are disseminated even throughout the so-called Soviet Union, and every effort of materialism in that area to overthrow these beliefs has notably failed. These beliefs exist in China, they exist in India, and in all parts of the world. Thus we have a tremendous body of belief in fundamental spiritual value. And yet just as we had this tremendous body uh, of believers in those days and in these times, we now find ourselves in the presence of the long shadow of a highly exaggerated hermetic thinking. We have in that the rise of science. We have the gradual recognition that we live in a scientific universe. We have man exploring the exactitudes of space, depending completely upon such sciences as mathematics for the possible calculations by which he seeks to attain his ends. And mathematics, as Pythagoras pointed out, is the first science of God. Thus we have an excessive intellectualism which has not yet achieved the hermetic position, namely that knowledge is suspended primarily from God as fact, the inevitable thing as it is, that God is total reality, and that this reality 
is the totality of all things known and unknown. And that no matter what we can ever know, we can never discover that which destroys the fact of reality. For all knowledge is the triumph of reality over superstition or ignorance. Thus, the infinite universe of realities, of facts, of scientific procedures, this universe is held within the tremendous principle of all fact, all reality, all procedure. And this principle is alive. This principle is a dynamic, not a static. And this principle permeates all other things with itself, so that everything that, is, that exists bears within it the stamp of reality. And man's search is the search for this reality in things, or in space, or in self. Now here we have, then, science rising. And even in our modern world, science is a minority group. Very definitely a minority group. It lives in the same world with a dynamic religion. Yet it is not reconciled with that religion. Yet its essential discoveries and principles are not irreconcilable with religion. They simply stand apart, much in the same way that hermit, hermetic philosophy and the early rise of Christianity, these stood apart. They had more in common than they ever knew, but they were never able to cement this common understanding. They were never able to bridge across between faith and fact. They never could recognize faith as another name for a scientific procedure. They were never able to recognize that the ways of faith are as scientific as the ways of atomic research. Because of this same division between two systems of thought, we are producing a generation of human beings in whose natures there are strong Irrecon irreconcilable, or at least unreconciled, divisions. The person of today, growing up in his world, is in the presence of a constant uh, pressure of conflicting conceptions and, con and conflicting convictions. Going to school, he is confronted with them. And at the present time, our policy is, if this person is potentially the type of material what we hope will become an intellectual leader is to pass him through four years of college the purpose of this being primarily to destroy his idealistic convictions we might as just as well face it that is what it amounts to the purpose of it is to make him worship knowledge and never to reveal to him that knowledge is merely the manifestation of the knower, and that without the universal knower, there could be no universal knowledge to challenge him. So we have this conflict, which inherited from the past, from little minority squabble 19 centuries ago, could very well and does very often land the modern young person in the juvenile courts because of conflict. Therefore, we cannot say that this long problem should just be allowed to drift, nor should we overlook the examples and the wisdom and evidence of the past relating to these things. Now, as we go along in this, we find there are other minority groups. As, as distinguished from the popular mind, a uh, structure very difficult to analyze at this time because it doesn't seem to be very sure of what it is thinking, if at all. The, in distinction to the popular mind, we have what we term the intellectual. Now, the intellectual, or the mental type, the individual who is searching for knowledge, per se, is not necessarily searching for mathematical formulas, he is searching for the power to know, and the end of knowing, of course, is the knowledge of good and evil. The knower, the intellectual, also presents a problem. We have had nearly 18 centuries of him in the post-Christian world under the general name of the intellectual leader, the philosopher, the scholar, 
uh, the learned person, the professor. Everything from the school teacher to the Oxford Dome comes under this particular heading. He is also the teacher, because the teacher is one in, of whom it must be assumed that he knows at least more than those he teaches. This is sometimes an assumption, but at the same time, there are evidences to sustain that in most cases, there is a certain leadership possible. But now this problem of knowing has given us a variety of knowing beliefs. And we have today the great clash of the intellectual schools. We have the Kantians and the Hegelians. We have the defenders of Schopenhauer and the defenders of Nietzsche. Uh, we have the new philosophies of every kind, from the idealism of Bergson to the prevailing uh, distemper of existentialism. We have these beliefs, beliefs of disillusionment, beliefs of despair, beliefs of frustration, and of hope, and of fear. We have beliefs of all kinds rising from or catering to the neurotic pressures of our time. So we have this mysterious thing of man who also seeks to know. He seeks to know ethically that which is good. He seeks to know to a degree idealistically uh, that which is true for him. He would like to live well if the effort is not too great. He would like to know more than he knows, first because he thinks he could earn more that way. Sometimes he would like to know enough to be able to console himself about his own uncertainties. He wants to know. The great desire to know rises strongly in the mass mind of mankind. And here we have the conflict between knowing and not knowing. And we have the big problem of the moment. The problem that has been argued and debated for years. Namely, can we know? What can we know? Can we know anything that we will not have to unknow at some later time? Is all knowing relative? Is knowing merely the collecting of the traditional belief of our race? Is the physician a true knower after he graduates from medical school? Is the lawyer a true knower after he has read Roman law and uh, British jurisprudence? What is knowing? Is it the individual familiarizing himself with the past, with other beliefs, with the statistical material available on the subjects that interest him? Is this knowing merely the handing on of report? And we have this very strongly in education. And Neoplatonism points out that the fallacy here is that all knowing must ascend that the end of knowing is that man shall truly know the truth. And that the truth is something that is apart from particular knowledge. You may, a man may discover something of truth by learning to play the piano. But if he does not add this concept to something else, he will become a musician, but he will not become a truth knower. That truth is something total, and that all education must in some way strive for this totality, but it does not know how. Thus there has to be this truth that sets us free, instead of this neo-truth that keeps us in bondage. The Neoplatonist answers very simply that the only solution to this problem is to recognize that man but takes in his own nature not only of the attributes of truth possibility, but the very substance of a living truth fact. That the truth resides in the innermost parts of the conscious life of man, and that the great journey of the individual is from ignorance to truth, and that truth is something supreme something infinitely sacred, something absolutely divine. 
and that therefore the search for truth is essentially uh, identical with the search for all realities with which the human being is concerned. The individual who attains to the state of truth has discovered why he should live well and how he can live well. There can therefore be no truth, as, the, as Plotinus points out, that does not produce a change away from error in the actual life of the person who attains it. A person can be educated and still unmoral. A person cannot possess truth or be possessed by truth and be unmoral. The individual can become learned and still be dishonest. But the one who attains truth cannot be dishonest. Therefore, truth is a transforming living thing. And that which attains it can never function inconsistently with that which it has attained. On this grounds, all knowledge is at the moment inadequate, for we have no form of knowledge which compels us instinctively, inevitably, and irresistibly to right action. We know much and still have to struggle with our own conscience. We know exactly what we should do, but we haven't the courage to do it. The truths we so-called possess are not dynamic enough to give us the vitality for the fulfillment of themselves in conduct. This is the great burden of uh, Neoplatonism, and it is certainly the burden of Confucianism. For Confucius said, the superior man is one who is incapable of an inferior action. It isn't one who doesn't perform it, because he knows better. It is the one who is incapable of it. Because the instinct which has given him this superiority, moving from within himself, is irresistible. It is moving from the same or deeper source, from the, or as the source or as the cause of his previous difficulty came from. He is moved from within to compromise. When truth is his, he is moved from within not to compromise. And he will always follow inward motion. And the reason why he does not do well always at the present time is because inward motion does not impel him to do well. So truth now becomes to Neoplatonism the irresistible, redeeming, regenerating, civilizing power. And nothing can be said to be true that does not change people for the better. It may be a fact that the uh, tides are affected by the moon. It may be a fact that there are certain formulas by which atoms can be split. It may be a fact that they have been split. But unless the discovery of how to split atoms <coughs> carries with it such a tremendous spiritual experience that the person who splits the atom can never, from any motive or reason, permit that knowledge to be used for anything but good. Unless that is there, there is no truth, regardless of the fact. Truth must be the power that makes us do things well and do that which is good. For the end of truth is to know that which is good and therefore to possess both the knowledge and the dynamic to perform that which we know. This is the danger pointed out by Neoplatonism in relationship to education. And their cry, their problem, their premise is just as sound today as it was then. And because they were a minority sect and at that time were neglected, those who say the same things today are a minority sect and will be neglected. But that which is said is nevertheless true. And whether it is accepted or rejected, as Neoplatonism points out, truth is unmoved, like the old American Indian proverb that is said to have been inscribed around the walls of the study of King George V of England. The moon is not frightened by the baying of wolves. 
That which is does not change, regardless of whether it is accepted or not accepted. Thus, Neoplatonism has its offering of today. Man searching for the dynamic of truth. And if he searched for the dynamic of truth as industriously and as patiently as he has sought other things, for instance, his knowledge of atomics, he would today not only have a great science, but a great morality to control it, which he does not have. Now, what is the contribution of Gnosticism to this little pattern? Here is the third group. This group working on an essentially religious level. The purpose of Gnosticism is the direct search for good. And in this search for good, we come to another problem uh, that confronts the modern world. And that is that with the Gnostics, and certainly with the attitude that they took, we have a large proposition confronting us to find out what is meant by good. The Gnosis says, until we know what is good, we can never do that which is right. What is good? What is this tremendous power of things at the root of existence? What is this power that Aquinas also debates in his double question as to whether a thing is good because God wills it or whether God wills it because it is good? What comes first, the good or the God? Is God good or is good God? And if God is not primary and must obey the law of good, then what is the law that God obeys? Or if God is primary and his will is good, then what is the good which he wills? These have been debated from the dawn of religious thinking. But the great problem that Gnosticism pointed out is this great need, this tremendous need, to integrate a common understanding of what is good. Now they were perfectly aware, even in Alexandria, that we have to approach good on two levels. Relative good and absolute good. Relative good we see around us every day. It is a common spectacle. A good which is locked within the dimensions of time. A good which cannot escape from the currency of things. A good which is refutable a hundred years from now and was not applicable a hundred years ago. There is a good which is also an immediate good. The imminent as opposed to the eminent. There is a good which is so difficult that at the moment it appears evil. There is also this un unending concept that the imperfect mind of man cannot achieve to a perfect statement of good or a perfect definition of good. What we call good is that which is agreeable or likable. What we call bad is that which is disagreeable or unlikable. That which injures another may be good for us. That which injures us may be good for another. All these problems in revolve around the effort of man to find the final central orientation of himself. Psychology is approaching this problem as, as uh, basically as it can, but is also uh, in a little dilemma for the reason that the psychologist cannot decide which of themselves is good. <laughs> they cannot decide which of their own systems certainly is best. They have therefore as yet no reconciled concept, no over concept. Now good can be achieved on a relative basis by a court of law which will come to justice as far as it can do so in the light of the evidence. And the good judge is the one who weighing the evidence gives the most honorable interpretation that he can. But that his interpretation is right, or that the evidence is true, he can never know. Thus the uh, Gnostic situation was the discovery of the nature of ultimate good. How is it to be done? And because Gnosticism was essentially a mystical tradition, 
it came to a very simple concept, namely that good cannot be known as a process of the mind. Good can only be experienced as the result of revelation. That good can only be bestowed upon man. That the experience of good is the experience of God in the life of that man. Now we can also say, of course, that this experience of God may be misinterpreted. And that what one man calls an experience of God may not seem so to another. And in the name of the experience of God, some very terrible things have been done to the world. And in a great many instances, uh, terrible doctrines and horrible edicts have been passed, undoubtedly, with the deepest sincerity and the full contrition of spirit. What, then, uh, is to guide us in the knowing of internal good? And, of course, Gnosticism points out that this is the entire concept behind the theory or the philosophy of various purgations of consciousness or cathartic philosophy, that producing a catharsis or cleansing of the individual. The only the individual in whose personal nature corruption has ceased can have the mystical experience of good. If any other person has such a kind of experience, he will distort it and deform it and profane it by the very process of it passing through his consciousness. If he is intolerant, the good will become merely distorted into an instrument for the advancement of his intolerance. Therefore, the individual who has his own purposes can never experience good per se. The only person who can experience good is one who has completely renounced self-interest and has completely renounced the human equation as an influence or part of his life. Thus the demand for the ascetic life, the renunciation of worldliness, the individual achieving a state in which nothing can be important but the revelation of the divine will. Now, the fact that the ascetic goes out and gives up the world does not prove that he is an ascetic. He may also be a neurotic and do the same thing. It does not prove that by any action of his outward person, no matter how consecrated that action may appear, that that action is without ulterior motive. Thus, in the Gnosis, uh, the, the point was very clearly uh, made that only through years of testing and of trying, only through the most diligent application of principles, the most total and complete analysis of self, and the final renunciation and rejection of everything that is ulterior within the self, can the individual come to the point in which he may depend upon the purity of revelation. But revelation, again, is a relative thing. And revelation, or the experiencing of the good, can come to many kinds of persons. We will not say necessarily that it is complete, any more than Gnosticism affirms that it is complete. But it can be an extension of our present realization of good. Now, the proof that it is a revelation and not an hallucination arises also from the consequences of it. At the moment, uh, there may be no way of testing. And here we come upon a point which has been made much of since Gnosticism and also in psychology, but it is essentially a point in Gnosis. And that point relates uh, to the individual who receives a revelation of some kind. Instinctively, he falls under mechanisms. One of these mechanisms is his desperate fear uh, to apply what he has experienced. The strange, mysterious sensing that if he applies it, 
he may lose it. This is only an extension of his own doubt about himself. He is perhaps inwardly aware that by nature, constitution, and attainments, that it is unreasonable or unlikely that truth could come to him. As long as he does not apply his revelation, he can always cling to it and hold it to be true. But if he applies it objectively and observes that it does not function correctly, if by application it disproves itself, then this individual is deprived of the support of a spiritual conviction within himself. So he is inclined to be careful not to apply. Yet in Gnosis, the first problem emphasized his application. The truth is revealed, it must then be applied. And if it is true, it will operate. And it will operate constructively. And it will produce nothing different from itself under any condition. If it is true, it will increase truth. If it is untrue, it will increase error. The individual, therefore, whose truth does not produce some kind of good has no truth. In this thinking, the search for good is therefore, in a sense, the search for harmlessness. It is the search for value which again produces within the individual a condition of integration or homogeneity of effort. And as the Gnostic Valentinus points out, the true experience of the good is most quickly tested by the fact that it produces the harmless person who is at the same time certain of his own conduct. The individual who by instinct cannot perform an action contrary to good. Revelation flowing out through the person is evidenced by a greater measure of good. And in our level of thinking there are good things which we hope for. They may not be ultimate but they cannot be deficient in any state superior to themselves. Therefore, we can say that kindness is not an ultimate good, that there may be good beyond it. But if that kindness is real, that ultimate good cannot be unkind, because it must not be deficient in any of the lesser forms of itself. Therefore, a kind of attitude of good, which leads to cruelty of conduct, cannot be good. A revelation which leads to intolerance cannot be true, because here is an assumed greater good in violation with a common good which experience has justified. Now we can say that absolute truth might violate everything less than itself. It will not violate anything of its own nature. It can only violate that which is contrary to its own nature. A greater sense or knowing of good may elevate our discrimination about all things. But good cannot make a person destructive. And anything which can is not good. And all excuse to the contrary is not valid. Because destructiveness, as Gnosticism points out, is a causation which sets in motion a sequence of further destructiveness. And that all of this destructiveness must ultimately be washed out by ultimate good that therefore this destructiveness forms the adversary which opposes good. In our daily thinking, which must be on the moderate level, we also, all of us, have some intuitive, conscious sense of good. And this good has been for the most part sustained whenever we have been able to practice it. Consequently, revelation must strengthen this good toward achievement of greater goodness. Revelation can never result in a quality which detracts from good. 
nor is it at all a matter of excuse or explanation. There is no way of explaining away facts. That which causes injury causes factual injury, and no rational integration or rational interpretation can justify the act of destruction. Therefore, in, the neo, in the Gnosticism, the purpose always is to measure the achievement of the Gnosis in the terms of the unfolding harmlessness of man. Now, wherever we have had religious intolerance or harmfulness caused by sincerity, we have nearly always found that it is associated with too limited a perspective towards values. And wherever the, uh, the effort to be true and to be right has led to trouble, it is because the troublemaker was devout but not intelligent. Therefore, good must also in, indicate or prove the presence of increasing ability to administer the power of God. <coughs> the individual who achieves a spiritual value receives with his inner understanding a sense <coughs> of use. It is not possible for an individual to say, for instance, as people have come to me and said, I've just been illuminated, what did it mean? You can't have such a situation. Inasmuch as an extension of consciousness is an extension of meaning and cannot exist apart from it. And any extension, apparently, of strange phenomenal circumstances not accompanied by an appropriate extension of understanding must be regarded as delusional of some kind. The individual cannot grow inwardly without improving his total nature. Though the Gnostic pointed out that the search for good becomes the supreme career of the truly devout person, for in his effort to serve God, his only protection is his own enlightened understanding. It is the only way in which he can preserve the honor of deity. For if in a benighted, fanatical manner he even tries to serve God, he will disgrace that which he serves. So all service involves man's growing ability to comprehend the good and to act according to the comprehension of the good which he possesses thus opening the way for the increase of this factor within his own experienced consciousness. Now here we have these patterns then, adding up to the problems of our time, coming down to us uh, as directive, as uh, for instance concerned with such a question as where will we all be as a civilization, as a people, a hundred years from now, not necessarily ourselves, we may not be present, but our world collectively thinking, where will this world be if we lack directives, if we continue to have no more internal resource than we have today, what will our external achievements do to us? And that was the question that the Gnostics were asking, and the Neoplatonists and the Hermetists 2,000 years ago, or nearly so. What are these directions without directive? They simply mean drifting along lines of opportunism or retrenching against immediate disaster without plan, purpose, program, or any design suitable to achieve lasting results. Now, as our primary purpose in this series is not only to compare these teachings, but to point out primarily the Hermetic position in preparation for a study of the actual Hermetic literature itself, I think we must come back now to their premise, the scientific premise, in which they reached out and actually enclosed a large part of both Gnosticism and Neoplatonism, 
at least the masters of the hermetic schools intertwine their teachings with those of these other schools and also with the system of Christianity. Christianity perhaps played a less important part in their thinking than the other schools for the simple reason that Christianity was an obvious thing. When you uh, say to someone, uh, do good to others, or be honest, or be kind, or, uh, or be brotherly, you do not challenge the scientist, nor do you challenge the philosopher. If he is a person of values, he admits that this is true, regardless of what the logic behind it may be. He might be able to spend ten years and develop the scientific explanation, but it would still only support something so obvious and so undeniable uh, that the, uh, there would be love's labor lost. There would be nothing gained by such an endeavor. Therefore, these schools sought to work with problems not quite so obvious, but which must ultimately arise in the course of growth, because in the course of growth, everything that is concealed must be revealed. And growth is the unfolding into the obvious of things not obvious. So the Hermetic School was seeking to create foundations upon which newer generations could uh, build structures of knowing by means of which the total pro program of, a, of human society could be advanced. They did not intend that these programs of knowing would I ever interfere with a Sermon on the Mount or any of these essential convictions of Christian mysticism. Uh, they were simply seeking for more exact instruments of knowing in specialized fields of endeavor. Now as we go into the alchemical phase of this, which began probably in the 6th or 7th century and continued on down to the rise of modern chemistry, hermetic philosophy was distinguished from the beginning by its byproducts. In addition to its principal theme, it inspired innumerable investigations. It inspired the alchemist to make all kinds of experiments in his retorts and in his laboratories. And I have seen lists of practical products that we use today uh, that uh, is very impressive, a very long list, hundreds of items, every one of which represented a disappointment to some alchemist. He was searching for the elixir of life or the mystery of the transmutation of metals, and he came up instead with a new formula for soap. Uh, it didn't quite work out as he intended, but he did make a valuable contribution. They locked uh, one alchemist uh, in a basement and fed him through a hole in the door of his cell until he was able to make gold. He never managed to make gold, but he discovered the formula for Dresden, China. All kinds of things have been found by those looking for something else. And uh, Hermetic philosophy has therefore indirectly contributed a great deal, practically all, of the basic knowledge of chemistry that we possess, and hundreds of byproducts arising in early uh, chemical research. However, the alchemist was more than this. He was searching for the one thing which must ultimately come. And he was, like most of us, sometimes sidetracked by his byproducts. He was never completely willing to stop trying, however. And even though some of his byproducts made him richer than the gold he might have fashioned, he still was searching for this other thing. He was searching for the master key uh, to the total transformation of matter. He was convinced that what we call matter is in reality spirit in disguise. He knew from his own experiences that everything that is not spiritual is a kind of spirit, limited, blocked, or impeded in some way. Therefore, every error is some kind of a truth that we have not yet mastered. Every delusion is a fact out of focus. Every failure tells us something about a success that lies within nearer grasp because of the reverse we have passed through. 
Thus man, with all his humanity, and it is a broad statement covering a wide variety of attributes, man in his total humanity is God itself. And with its divinity locked within this strange casement of base metals, and uh, the effort to find the science for the release of this divine factor, the science for the release of reality, of fact, of the total hermetic mystery, was his challenge, and it has always been his challenge. His challenge was not to conquer nature, but to release nature. As one of the great alchemists, Bacillus Valentinus, said, the end of alchemy is man becoming the voluntary servant of nature. That nature must be obeyed, and that wisdom is not the ravishing and ravaging of nature. The uh, wisdom is man achieving a subtle, sensitive, spiritual rapport with nature, in which man can cause nature to open her wonders, reveal them without fear to the being who is without fault. This is almost exactly the wording of Valentinus. And uh, it is the, the idea, the concept of man persuading, man inducing the universe to give up its secret. And this secret to be won only by man's love and not by man's strength. Won by the wisdom principle, by the principle of obedience the acceptance of the challenge and the acceptance of the responsibility, both together. So in the, in the Hermetic philosophy, we have this pattern outlined, gradually unfolding through the Hermetic books, which conceal it under allegory and legend. But what the Hermetic philosopher was seeking for was this wonderful, mysterious, powder of transmutation, the red lion, the mysterious power which changes all things instantly. And that mysterious power was to his way of operating, some way locked up in the mystery of universal or divine mind. That this mind had some way within it the power of the spontaneous release of itself. The mind as the bridge between nature and God can be crossed. And that this mind can, in some mysterious way, open a blazing core of facts by means of which the individual becomes master of the world. Not because he becomes its ruler, not because he becomes richer than someone else, not because others honor him, but simply because he has achieved mastery over illusion. That he stands in the full awareness of the glory of the creating power. That he accepts totally the highest of all scientific facts, and that is this fact of the eternal presence of this gold, this mysterious substance locked in everything. The alchemist says, and I remember uh, the work by Weidenfeld, uh, The Secret of the Adepts, in which it is stated that the alchemist does not manufacture gold. He does not create gold. He discovers it. He finds it where it is. He causes it to grow. He feeds it the nutrition that is necessary for its survival. And when he has brought it forth into birth, then this gold will transmute a world of base metals, a hundred thousand times its own weight, into the purest gold. This is the great golden key of science. 
science which can transmute and transform all need, all inability, all lack into an abundance by drawing upon the universal principle of truth or gold that is locked in everything. And man having discovered the perfect science of sciences can then transform or transmute a hundred thousand times the weight of truth and ignorance and transform it immediately into pure gold. For wherever this touches, it is like the fabled king of Crete. Everything it touches is turned to gold. Thus everything that the true science key touches or unlocks is turned into truth, turned into reality, uh, turned into a useful and necessary aid to the advancement of the total state of the universe and along with it the immediate state of man. So the search for the science of sciences, the science which transforms that which is not spirit into spirit again, or releases spirit, causing it to grow in all things, including in man himself, until it becomes the master of the world. All of these speculations were concealed in terms strange and obscure, but changed into modern language and into modern thinking. There is not one of these speculations that does not have a contemporary ap application. It points out to us the things we must do now, the things that need the doing, and reminds us as we gather here that as in Alexandria, there will only be a few who will know what is needed or will be impelled to meet that need. But out of each generation there must be some who will carry on this mysterious golden thread until in the fullness of time the restoration of essential learning can be achieved. Because the answer was there in the beginning and until men accept the answer the problems can never be solved. And in these answers that we have suggested I think we lay a sufficient foundation to go on later with the next step of our hermetic researches. And thank you very much.